And let's turn to Esther chapter 9 tonight, and for those of you with us for the first time, uh, as well as a reminder for the rest, we've been looking at the book of Esther, and we're going to finish up, Lord willing, our study through this book tonight, Esther chapter 9, and let's look, if you will, at verse 26 to 28, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, just a couple of things of note, uh, first of all, uh, for those who are part of our church family, if you could pray for uh, Andrew Moore, some of you have been tracking with them, at least some brief updates. I did text with Mandy just a few minutes ago uh, before church, one of our deacons who is recovering from treatments from cancer, and they were actually coming back from family vacation, and she just, she gave an update. He's in uh, the hospital in Cleveland right now. They were trying to get him home uh, instead of having to stop somewhere between Tennessee and here, but she said Andrew has clots in his right lung. Uh, his leg and his abdomen, uh, and uh, they have started him on a heparin uh, earlier this morning. He's supposed to have a, P, uh, a PET scan done uh, today, um, and he also has some fluid on his left hip that's causing him a lot of pain, so there's a lot of moving parts to that, but if you pray for Andrew, and uh, Carol mentioned Mandy's been up for <laughs> probably more than a day at this point, so just pray if you would for their family, uh, God's grace and strength for them, and so have you been asking about him. So let's Let's partner together to pray for them the next few days, and if there's something that we can do as a church to help them, I'll definitely be in communication with you on that. So if you pray for them, but Andrew's a trooper, uh, and uh, I know he's been in a lot of uh, pain uh, this last little bit here especially, and so if you would pray for him. Uh, and then secondly, just a reminder about things coming up this summer, um, that tomorrow we start VBS, and again for our church family, just due to uh, Brother Nick, his uncle passed away, so they'll be out of town this week, and then just with other moving parts. something? Hey, there we go. Did you do anything? No? All right. Okay, thank you. I have an extra mic if I need it, so we can go for hours here. Good. Um, maybe. Um, actually, Dave said to me, those batteries are charged, and I should have confirmed that myself. So. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, if you didn't hear me, we could use a few more helpers this week. So even if you can only give us a day or an evening, um, we especially could use a few men um, and so just that little seed thought, if God leads you to be a part of that this week, if you can't pray for us as we have munchkins here on property and trying to minister God's truth to them, excited to see what God does this week, Monday to Thursday. And then two weeks from today, we're having our, uh, red, white, and barbecue where we'll have lunch on the grounds. And we didn't say it this morning, but if you can plan to bring a side dish, everything else will be provided by the church. We'll have a tent set up out back and not an evening service that night. If you have questions, you can see Michelle Hinkle who is our fearless leader with our meals, but uh, that'll be in just uh, over two weeks here, or just under two weeks. All right, Esther chapter 9, let's look, if you will, at verse 26 down through verse 28. And uh, just to bring everyone up to speed, we've been looking at, for such a time as this, and the fact that we must step up in seasons of challenge or crisis, and God uses that, the studying on how God used Esther and Mordecai. Let's pick up in verse 26, wherefore they called these days, the days they refer to of celebration of God's deliverance, uh, Purim after the name of Pure. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter in which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail uh, from among the Gentiles, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And so we want to look at tonight, lastly, stepping up during Purim seasons. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for these rich songs we've just heard and been stirred by. Thank you for these young men and the potential they have for you and how you're using them. Thank you for uh, this ministry, and thank you for folks you've brought our way this evening. Pray for those who are traveling, those who are under the weather, many things, Lord, that our church family is navigating this week. Thank you for keeping us safe through the storms earlier this week as well. And uh, Lord, as we now gather around your word, I pray that you would use it to challenge us where needed. 
to believe that you're still able to intercede and to interject yourself into human history on behalf of your people. Renew that confidence and that resolve in our hearts, and may it cause us to stand more faithfully for you in this day. Bless this study, be honored in how it's preached, how it's taught, how it's received, and how we each live it out in our lives this week. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, On Thursday, I believe it was of this week, I was at the gas pump just down the street here. And I don't know if you have certain painful experiences as I do. I was joking, I think, last week about I don't want to be a millionaire. I just want to be able to look off into space while I pump gas. Like, I don't even care. Whatever the number is doesn't matter. Just wish I had that kind of wealth and affluence. Um, And so I was at the gas station this past Thursday and you could just sense it as we all were pumping, the, the commiseration. We didn't say anything to each other, but there was every pump was filled. Gas was just south of five bucks a gallon or whatever it was, just over, I think, 502, something like that. And we're all pumping gas. And then we started to hear clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. And around the corner, right here, this main intersection, you have an Amish buggy go by this way and then this way. And we all were standing there pumping, thinking the same exact thing. And, and one old, older gentleman, he verbalized, like, that's starting to make more sense every day, you know, is his, his response. And we all were thinking it, like, we're the, we're the fools here, you know, we're the ones, what are we, why are we doing this? Um, can I just tell you, I don't know when what we're, what we're trending in with gas is going to end, but it seems like things aren't going in a good direction on a few fronts. Do you feel that way tonight? Uh, I do. Um, And yet we have young people not in the room tonight who have a future and we're trying to inspire them and encourage them and trying to say the right things and project the right things. Can I say to you tonight as we look at this last chapter and a few verses in chapter 10, that the future is bright for God's people. And I think if we're not careful, that is affecting us a lack of belief in that more in the present tense than we realize. And I just want to reaffirm tonight, at least for, this is therapeutic for me, and I hope it is for you as well, that God is still, he's still got this thing called the future, and it should affect us uh, in the present tense. And so I think often where we're sitting, that we should be standing, where we're bowing out, where we should be shouldering under, is because we truly have forgotten and do not believe fully that God uh, is taking care of his people. Now, we're in Esther chapter number nine. Go back to chapter three for just a minute. And I just, I think we need to look at this for those who have been in here with us for our series as a reminder, and just to be thorough tonight for those who have not. Look, if you will, in chapter 3 of Esther and verse number 7. This would be prior to all of the story of Haman being talk, taken down by God himself as he connives and seeks to attack um, the Jewish people and uh, the city uh, of Shushan and in the empire of Persia. And in verse 7, it says, In the first month, as the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. And so we see that this day that we're about to talk about was instituted by the casting of lots called pure. And so from that, we get this feast called Purim uh, that we're going to talk about tonight for a few minutes in the time uh, that we have left. And so we see God providing and protecting and working on behalf of his people. Standing tonight for a feels absent God, and sometimes he feels that way, doesn't he? We just heard some songs about that, that God is faithful and we're to lean into that, but sometimes he feels absent. Standing for a feels absent God must be done by relying upon two Purim provisions. Let's talk about those in the time we have left. So Esther is a book that we don't see the name of God, but we see God everywhere in the book of Esther, working in the circumstances, working in the setbacks. And so we need to look for these provisions that God provides, not just in this day, but in our day for his glory and honor. Let's talk about two of them in the time we have left. Number one, let's talk about, first of all, a Purim from God that involves his deliverance. God provides for us, for we who are his people, his deliverance. And I would give you two things that sometimes push against that, that we must look past to see and to anticipate his deliverance. And in our bulletin, there is our notes, if you'd like to fill in these few blanks uh, as we go through our study this evening. Number one, how do we access this Purim of deliverance We need to be willing to step up when God provides 
perceptional deliverance. When there is deliverance in how we are viewed, how he is viewed, how God's people are viewed in the eyes of the world that is watching. Some of you can remember this. I barely remember this. But do you remember the campaign by A&W Root Beer when they were trying to compete against McDonald's? Um, A&W Root Beer, uh, which now I think is merged with some of the, the other brands as, such as Taco Bell and KFC and things, they introduced a third pound burger to compete against McDonald's quarter pounder. You want to know why it failed? Because most people thought that a third pound burger was smaller than a quarter pound burger. Do you, can you do that math in your head? So one quarter is bigger in some people's perception than a one third. Three is smaller than four. You follow that? I'm not kidding you. And it flopped completely. You know how much of our world is shaped by our perception? And can I remind us tonight, much of the perception that we have of God, and especially the world has of God, is not accurate. And what I love about God is He wants, He owns how He's perceived. And He wants to use us as we're faithful in His presence and before Him to show this world His power and His provision. Just a thought tonight. Does our world have a skewed view of God? They do, don't they? He, he's vindictive, he's capricious, he's manipulative, or he's just at a distance. Who is God going to reveal his accurate perception through unless it's we as his people? Like, that's exciting to me. Isn't that to you that in our day, when glimpses of God are so rare, at least with clarity, that he can create snapshots of his provision and his grace through us? Here's the, the challenge, though. We have to stand for him for that to be projected and for that to be perceived by the world around us. And so we see Esther and Mordecai and those who followed them willing to do just that. All right, notice two things about perception that God changed in this day that I think he wants to do today. Look at verse 1 back in chapter 9. We'll just work our way through this text quickly tonight. Now in the 12th month, that's the month Adar. So that's the month that, that the, the pure fell upon, that the, the, the die uh, was cast for on the 13th day of the same, this same month, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near, drew near to be put into execution, and the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. That little section, that a positive, what's in parentheses there is almost the, the writer, he just can't help himself. He's got to tell us how it ends before really we get to the details of it, all right? So we'll come back to that. What happens? Verse 2. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because, here it is again, the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. All right, let me give you a couple things under that. Number one, God gives to his people perceived fear. Others fear God's people because of God's provision on their uh, behalf. The word all that's found in verse 3, I take that literally. All the rulers of the Persian Empire got in step with God and his people. Those who were in power had fear of the people and of their leader, Mordecai himself. And so we see this fear or this respect that God gave to his people through those who watched them. If our world today, tonight, can be motivated by fear against us, right? A lot of times the reason the world hates us and resists us as God's people is because they're afraid of something. Conviction, confrontation. If, God, if they're motivated by fear against us, cannot God who can redeem anything actually turn that for his purpose and plan? And those who fear us and fear what we stand for can ultimately fear God as we allow him to work in and through us. Psalm 47, 2, for the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. God can evoke fear. Don't you wish that there was just more of a reverence in our day? I do. There's just no fear of God before their eyes. God, God can resolve that. God can confront that. God can bring that back if we'll be faithful to stand for him. All right, verse 4. For Mordecai was great. This is kind of explaining why they feared uh, the Jews and Mordecai. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed or grew greater 
and greater. Number two, perceived fame. So perceived fear. Number two, perceived fame. We see the fame of Mordecai and of the Jewish people spreading uh, throughout uh, the Persian Empire. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Haman, who is the counter everything that Mordecai is, how did he gain and consolidate his power? These same rulers, right? They reverenced him. They bowed when he walked into the room. And God now moves these same people to not fear uh, more, uh, Haman, but to fear Mordecai, God's uh, hero, God's man. And so we see this given to him by God himself. I was thinking about this as it relates to our lives. Do you know a lot of our life is wasted trying to run our own PR campaigns? Um, for those of us on social media, we're not necessarily promoting and elevating Jesus Christ and the ministry and the hope of the gospel. If we're not careful, we're promoting ourselves, right? We're promoting even our little part of ministry or our little family. What would happen if we were free of that? If we let God take care of how we're perceived and we just got our head down doing what God has called us to do uh, and be. And so we see Mordecai and the Jews flourishing in a perceptional way because God was the one working on their behalf. All right, go to verse 5. We see a second deliverance that God provides to his people, not just in Esther 9, but tonight. Look at verse, verse 5 of chapter 9. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies. I love all these alls. All their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. Number two, step up when God provides military deliverance. So we have perceptional deliverance. We also have military uh, deliverance. We have God entering into time and space to protect and to provide for his people in a very literal sense. Two things about that. Number one, military assertiveness. Do you see the assertiveness of the Jewish people? I don't see anywhere where they just stand passively. Do you see that there? That verse 5 says, did you see that? Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of a sword. They still had to pick up the sword. They still had to stand. Here's what I hear in our day. I can't wait till Jesus shows up. And by that we mean, if we're not careful, I just want to be a passive part of what God's doing. We have a part in this, brethren. We have it to stand in the gap, to stand up for something, and, and, and to be what we should be for the Lord. It is our assertiveness that stewards faithfully God's deliverance in our day. Here's my question to you tonight. What if the next move is not God's, but yours? What if the next thing God wants to do is not us waiting on Him to do something, but it's something we need to assert ourselves in? He's led, He's guided, it's, it's our move. We see the Jews willing to lean in and to receive all that God had promised them. Verse 6 goes on, And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. It begins to throw some massive numbers at us of how they were assertive uh, with what God gave them. Look down at verse 15. We'll come back to the interluding verses in a moment. Verse 15, for the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day uh, also of the month Adar. So it's talking about these two different uh, regions um, in Shushan and then the rest of the kingdom. On the 14th day, also the month of Adar, and slew 300 men at Shushan, but on the prey, they laid not their hand. We'll come back to that phrase in a moment. Verse 16, but, other, but the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes. Here it is, big number, 70 and 5,000. And so we see that the Jews rose up. The Jews stood up and over 75,000 of their enemies uh, were killed. Now, it's interesting, and we read it there at the end of verse 15, but if you go back to verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 10, but on the spoil they lay not their hand, uh, verse 15, excuse me, <laughs> verse 15, but on the prey they lay not their hand, the end of verse 16, but they lay not their hands on the prey. And so thought tonight is this, they were assertive, but they didn't overstep. And I think that also would be the other extreme. Some of us are too passive, and some of us run way ahead of God. Do you see the tension there as they let God provide the deliverance and they did their part, but they didn't overassume or presume upon the Lord. They were faithful to steward uh, what God was providing for them in deliverance. We as God's people have become so used to being on the defensive 
that we're missing the open doors of victory that could be seized, ground that could be gained. Um, just this morning, one of our deacons and I got to meet with a new family and talk to them about their salvation. And like God's on the move in positive ways, right? To share the plan of salvation and to see how God's working in that home and family. And do you, are, you, are you missing those opportunities like I am at times? Being willing to go back on the offensive. We're so busy protecting and, and, and playing it safe that we're missing these open doors that our God, who's always on the move, is providing for his people. All right, go back to verse 7. And in verse 7 and fo- <laughs> excuse me, verse 7 and following, we see the list of the ten sons of Haman. And for fun, I would read them to you tonight, but I will not. Okay, verse 7 uh, through verse 9 gives us the ten sons of Uh, of Haman. And we see them listed there in verse 7 to 9. Verse 10, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadethai, the the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hands. So we see all ten, those that are listed there in verses uh, 7 through 9, they also suffer at the hands of the Jews. Number two, jot this down, military closure. So military assertiveness. Number two, we see God's people willing to be a part of military closure. God buttons it all up in the story. He doesn't just deal with Haman. He deals with all of his sons. All ten of them, by the way, who are hung upon the same gallows that Haman had constructed to hang Mordecai upon. The closure that God provides uh, for his people. You know, basically what happens here in chapter 9 is God brings into light all of those who have anti-Semitic tendencies and he wipes them out. Isn't that amazing? He brings all that to the surface, and he addresses all of that. He brings closure to these threats that were not even known uh, by uh, the Jews. Um, It was interesting, when I was in Israel in January, we had a Messianic Jewish guide, and I was just thinking about the names of Haman there. And we would have these conversations over and over where we would say to him when we were out of sight, hey, what about King so-and-so? And he would just look at us, and we keep saying it. And finally, he would realize we kind of Anglo, you know, us English had totally butchered the pronunciation. And then he's like, oh, you mean so-and-so, you know. And often our, our guide would have to have it translated to him. It, it's just funny to me how often God deals with these things in a very precise and detailed way. And we miss uh, where God is trying to bring, clo- bring closure uh, in our lives. Could this have been left, an op- left open-ended? Haman's sons are not killed. God's judgment is not brought to bear. Where would that have led? These 10 young men and the hatred and the revenge and God here buttons all of that up because God's people were willing to stand. When you and I step up instead of backing down, God gives not partial but complete victory over our enemies. And here will be the thought tonight. Here's where we fail. We don't stay standing long enough to see that. We stand for a minute we speak a word, but then we, we back away. I want to see God complete his work in me. I want to see him do everything he wants to do through me and in me and in my sphere of influence. And so I've got to stay standing more often and longer to experience all that he provides. Um, I don't know why I'm on this bent today, but I think sometimes as it relates to the book of Revelation, we're overly fascinated with some aspects of it. And Here was a thought someone sent me the other day that I think maybe speaks to that. A pastor friend of mine said this, I'm convinced that many Christians have become so engrossed in the study of Revelation because speculation is easier than application. We would rather guess about distant events than our own present and personal responsibilities. And I just want to encourage us tonight, this day, tonight, and this week is a part of what God wants to do for his people. So we need to stand, not kick up our feet or panic and bolt to the highest mountain somewhere. We need to be faithful, waiting on God to provide his deliverance. And I have found God's deliverance is less instantaneous in a big flash, and it's more incremental and progressive. Day by day, God is delivering me from my own flesh. Is he not you? He's delivering us one moment at a time from all the cares and troubles of this life. See that, lean into that, stand as he provides his deliverance. All right, go to chapter 9 now in verse 17, and we see a second Purim blessing that we should be fueled by and driven by to stand for the Lord. 
Verse 17, on the 13th day of the month, Adar. So now all this has gone down and God has proven himself and delivered his people. And on the 14th day of the same rested they and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Gladness. Number two, let's talk for a minute about the Purim of celebration. This day of Purim, not just the deliverance, but the celebration of that same deliverance. A friend of mine posted <laughs> the other day a picture of their dog, and I don't know what type of dog. It's a real um, designer-type breed dog, very expensive dog. But his dog was sitting in the living room, and the dog had found the only sunlight. Have you ever noticed how your dog will find or your cat will find like where the warm spot is? And this was before maybe we're trying to avoid the warmness lately that we've been in. And he said that, he just posted this underneath it, cover me in sunshine. Somehow she manages to find her sunspot every day. And he was talking about how she would move, the dog would move to find the sun. You know, we live in a very dark world, don't we? And I think one of the things we need to get better at as the people of God is to find the bright spots about our God and celebrate them. You think God does what he does just to get you out of the pickle you're in or the bind you're in? Do you think he does that because he also wants to celebrate it? Like, aren't we going to spend eternity not just talking about what now is, but celebrating what we no longer have and what he's delivered us from? So this deliverance, this Purim reality that we have with God is not just about, who we made it out of the situation. It's now to enjoy and savor his provision in the months and years and millennium to come to celebrate what he has done for his people. And just maybe a thought tonight for you to chew on. One of the things I most look forward to about eternity in heaven is how those individual deliverances all merge around the throne of the Lamb. Because there are things that uniquely we've been delivered of as the, as the church age saints that are a little different than those of the nation of Israel. They parallel, but they're unique aspects of that. Isn't that going to be amazing? And then we talk about our individual deliverances. Haven't we all been delivered from things? From ourselves? That's probably the number one thing God has gifted me with, is delivering me from myself at times. And will for all of eternity be a part of those celebrations. And so we need to learn how to let that fuel our faithfulness and our stand for the Lord uh, in the present tense. All right, let's talk about a couple of things in the, <laughs> excuse me, the time we have left. Number one, jot this down, step up when God provides official celebration. And we see this, this uh, given an official assent uh, as we see here in the text. Verse 17, we just read it. Notice they make it a feast. Verse 18, the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof, and on the 14th day thereof, and on the 15th day of the same, they rested and made a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month, Adar, a day of gladness and feasting, and a good day, and of sending portions one to another. All right, two things out of that. Number one, we see they form an official holiday. And that's being referenced here in verse 17 through 19. You have the provincial Jews, uh, and you have the Jews in the capital in Shushan, and the debate is between the 14th and the 15th day, and so they, they combine and merge and create this day of celebration. It's interesting, the word good day, those two words are found also in verse 22. In the middle of the verse there, it was a good day. Back in chapter 8 and verse 17, there was a good day that preceded this day, so it's a good day, it's a holiday, it's a celebration of what God has done for uh, his people. You know what's amazing is that God can take a day intended by this world and the enemies of our God that they intend to do much evil, and he can turn that exact day into one of the best days. Do we still believe that about tomorrow and the next day and all the doom and gloom that swirls around us? That God can take an evil day and transform it into the good day. All right, verse 20. And Mordecai wrote these things, sent a letter unto the Jews that were in all the uh, provinces of the king of Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they would keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and the 15th day of the same yearly. So both days. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, in the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. Uh, go, if you will, down in verse 17. The Jews ordained, we just read these verses, took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it would not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing 
and according to their appointed time every year. The end of verse 28, uh, the memorial of them should perish, from, nor the memorial of them should perish from their seed. Number two, an official memorial. So it's a holiday. It's also a memorial. It's not just a celebration. It's also a remembrance of what God had provided for uh, his people. Out of curiosity, I just looked, what, how's that translate to today? How do the 14th and 15th day of month of Adar, what is that in our calendar? Uh, for this year, you do know the Jews still celebrate this, right? The Purim feast is a, is a prominent feast in the Jewish calendar. This current year, typically it's in March or April. In 2022, it was March 6th and 7th. So just a few months ago, the Jewish people would have gathered. Think about how many years they've been doing this, memorializing what God has done so many years ago, still remembering his provision. Now, here's the convicting part. We often, brethren, forget the deliverances of God. We don't, we don't commemorate them. And that's why we stop standing for him. He's worth standing for. If he's been faithful in the past and we celebrate it and commemorate it and memorialize it, it's worth being faithful again today. And so these yearly rhythms, there ought to be things you memorialize on a regular basis as families on Father's Day, things you remember when God delivered you and sustained you and protected you. It fuels our faithfulness uh, in the present tense. Uh, I didn't ask Abel if I could do this. That's why I, I didn't ask him. He might not let me, but uh, Miss uh, Judith sent me this picture. So a few months ago, they went through Esther, and Abel uh, here is, is celebrating somewhat how they celebrate the feast. Um, and I'll just read what Judith sent me. This kind of is a summary. She said, a few months ago, we read the book of Esther with Abel as part of his homeschool curriculum. The activity went, that went with it asked us to bake a traditional Jewish cookie uh, called a hamantashen, meaning Haman's pockets, to celebrate Purim. Also, he made a rattle box called a grogger. Uh, then we read Esther chapter 6 and 7, and each time Haman's name was mentioned, he shook the grogger loudly to blot out the name of evil. Then we ate the cookies. And so some of that, they're doing that. The Jews just did that in March. Still memorializing, still remembering, still celebrating uh, the deliverance of our God. And so my question to you tonight is this, before we move to our last point, are there official celebrations and memorialized celebrations that you're doing to remember what God has provided in your life? There are things that if God had not showed up at certain key moments and junctures in our life, we would not be here tonight, right? And I think we're slipping where we should be standing because we're not remembering those things enough. We're not remembering, remembering them in a poignant way. Uh, visible way that reminds us it's worth it to stay faithful to the Lord. All right, let's end tonight in the end of chapter 9. So we see Mordecai giving his official memorandum and affirmation of this feast. Notice now Esther does the same. Verse 29, then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai the Jew wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim, and he sent the letters unto all the Jews, into the twenty and seven provinces of the king of Ahaz, a king, the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth, to confirm these days of Purim and their times appointed, according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had, uh, queen had enjoined them, and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of fasting and their cry, and decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book." Lastly, jot this down, step up when God provides perpetuated celebration. So official, but also perpetuated celebration. Stepping up when God says, this is something I want you to remember over and over and over again. Um, one of the things that we do on the side, uh, part of ministry as a family and out of our church is Inspire Counseling Ministry. We do wellness weekends once a month or so uh, at other ministries. And I just schedule with a friend of mine who's a church planner, um, a wellness weekend next spring. And he was talking about how church planning is like, uh, it's it just a unique experience. And we were kind of celebrating and commiserating together. He was talking about the idea that it just, there's no, it, you're just launching out and you're risking everything. And to see God uh, sustain a, a church plan is, is just profound to say the least. And one of the things I've noticed is those of us who were at North Life Baptist at the beginning, there's only a few of us left because you can't put up with me too long. You'll figure that out too as the years go by. Um, but those of us who were at the beginning, Pastor Nathan, I'm sure, could remember this and others, is it's an absolute miracle that we're still here, okay? 
Um, it's still a miracle. We got, since last Sunday, we're still here, okay? But especially early on, it was just, it was literally, some have said church planning is like trying to fly a plane while you're building it. You're in the air and you're still pop riveting stuff together, okay? That's literally how it feels. But I've noticed for those of us who were at the beginning, every anniversary Sunday, as we're now almost 13 years into this and it'll be this fall, is it's a little sweeter to the, us that we're here toward the beginning. And all of you that God has led our way, is, it, we're grateful for your part in that. But there's something unique about just stepping out on God's leadership and his provision and counting upon him and doing it yearly. Just remembering what God has done for his people. Are you doing that? Am I doing that on a regular basis? All right, two things under that were done. Number one, you see a perpetuated authority. So Esther puts this into the official record of the kingdom, the royal archives. Um, she emphasizes this is to be done, and so the perpetuated authority. She wanted this to outlive her. She wanted the Jewish people to do this long after she was gone. And so both her and Mordecai affirm that this is to be done yearly in remembrance of God's provision. What are you throwing your authority behind? What do you want to outlive you? Uh, to be faithful to the Lord, we must stand for Him and celebrate what He has provided for us uh, in our lives. I've found those who step up on behalf of others in moments of crisis tend to have a longevity to their influence and authority that others do not. You live for yourself, you're going to lose your authority and influence. You live for God, you live for those He's called you to lead and serve, it will outlive you. The perpetual influence of a life that's committed to standing for God and serving those that have been put uh, into their lives. All right, and then I love this little chapter, kind of this addendum. Let's go to chapter 10 and spend just a moment here as we bring this to conclusion tonight. And the king, Ahasuerus, has laid a tribute upon the land, upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him. Are they not written the book of the chronicles of the kings of, of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next on the king Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. Lastly, perpetuated influence. Perpetuated authority, perpetuated influence. A friend of mine posted this today. This was a note from his daughter. Dear Dad, happy fat Ur's day. And... He said, the caption was, I guess I need to go on a diet. Happy fat first day. Um, do you know for a lot of us, if we're not careful, we live for ourselves. And as we do so, unlike Mordecai, our influence reduces, it shrinks, it, it, it evaporates. Mordecai lived for others. And because he lived for others, his influence increased instead of decreased. In verse number 1 and 2, we see the author emphasizing the might and the power of Xerxes, of Ahasuerus. According to history, Xerxes died in 465 B.C., and before that happened, all of this influence and all of this wealth, it, emphasizing how unlikely it was that a Jewish man could come out of nowhere and have the authority and influence over all of those resources on behalf of the Jewish people. And so we see this just wonder in what God did uh, for his people. And then verse 3, we see this generous man living for others, not living for himself. What a contrast between Mordecai and Haman, the faithfulness of this man to serve others. Does not this verse explain why God expanded Mordecai's influence back in 9 and verse 4, right? His influence increased because he would use that influence for others. 1 John 2 and verse 17, And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Doing God's will, being faithful, and serving others with it is what makes the difference. All right, go back to chapter 9 and verse 1, and we'll finish there tonight as we remind ourselves and convince ourselves anew and afresh that God can still deliver and provide for his people. Esther 9 and verse 1. And before we look at that, I wanted to show you one last picture uh, this is a man, I don't know him real well, but he posted this the other day, uh, 12 years ago. He was in an accident. Um, he was burning brush, and the gasoline exploded in his face. 
Um, and according to the, the numbers that I could ascertain, 12% uh, of his body was covered with 12 and third degree burns, um, especially on his face and upper torso. And his wife, who's pictured there with him now, Carrie, uh, he says there, this is only 50, 56 days from their wedding. So they're not yet married in that picture. This was obviously several years ago. And he says, I remember telling her, you don't have to marry me. You don't have to. He said, I'm damaged goods or however he used that releasing her. And he was just celebrating. They've now been married for over a dozen years. And he said she sent her wedding invitations from the ER room. Commitment to the one she had been betrothed to. You know that our God is not going to give up on us as his people? Like, I think our faltering knees, we're not standing because we think he's long since moved on from us. We've dropped the ball and our world's not great. And all, we all have issues, don't we? He is faithful. He will not abandon his people. And the, the thrust in the message of the book of Esther, the big takeaway is God's not done with us. He's not done with you. He's not done with me. And so can we not stand? Can we not stand with expectation that he will prove himself? All right, look here in Esther 9 and we'll finish. I love this phrase again. Just remind you of at the end of verse 1. Though the Jews were in a pickle, they were in a bind, and those who were against them thought they would have power over them. Notice this, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. Turn to the contrary. And the Jewish people, the book of Esther is a precious book. For us as Gentiles, if we're not careful, it's just, it's one of the books that maybe is even in question, should it be in the Bible? God's word name isn't mentioned, and we don't really see a lot of sacred implications in it, so-called. To the Jewish people, the book of Esther is a reminder that God is faithful and God will not forsake his people. And we as God's people in the New Testament age, may we draw from it the encouragement God is always looking and seeking to prove himself on our behalf. This question, and we'll pray, would you let the belief that our best days are ahead of us steady your spine, solidify your knees to stand anew and afresh today, tomorrow, and every day until Jesus shows up? Are we willing to do that? And if we are, God will help us to model what he can deliver us from and what we can celebrate about. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word.